Hidden beneath the surface of the sea are animals still yet to be discovered. Animals we could only imagine in our wildest dreams, sharing secret lives, staring stories still yet to be studied. The more we explore, the more we realize an uncomfortable fact. Our insatiable appetite for raw materials from nature is changing the ability of our planet to support a habitable world for the rich diversity of life, including ourselves. So come with me to a secret world, and let's go on expedition to the beautiful, magical coral reefs of Papua New Guinea. I was with Jean-Michel Cousteau and his expedition team, filming for a TV series, documenting some of the smallest, secretest animals found on coral reefs. We were diving on some beautiful, healthy coral reefs, but this was in 2008. Much has changed in the health, abundance, and productivity of coral reefs around the world. Fortunately, some places like Papua New Guinea, the reefs are still relatively healthy, but they need our help. And it all starts with the understanding of some of the smallest animals that live on coral reefs. Coral reefs are the richest marine ecosystems on our planet, home to over one million species. Of all the plants and animals found in the ocean, about 25% of them are found on coral reefs. But yet, coral reefs cover only 1% of our planet. So let's go on expedition again. As a marine biologist and as an explorer, I want to take you down. And we're going to go down, and I want you to help me find a pygmy seahorse. It's going to take a lot of effort. And I need your help, because pygmy seahorses are some of the smallest of animals found on coral reefs. So we're down to a depth about 100 feet, looking at a huge, large gargonian or sea fan. And pygmy seahorses are really small. Do you see it? There it is. Beautiful. Pygmy seahorses are so well camouflaged, blending into their natural environment and spending pretty much their entire life on a, their single host. And in this case, it's the Gargonian for this one species. Beautiful. <laughs> there are 47 different species of seahorses found around the world, living in different habitats and at different depths. And of the 47 different species of seahorses, seven are considered pygmy. And all pygmy seahorses live within the coral triangle of Southeast Asia. Their anatomy and strange sex life fascinate scientists. The seahorse couple mates by touching snouts and bellies and a floating heart that is as charming as a seahorse itself. In perfect unison, the female passes her unfertilized eggs to the male's brooding pouch. He'll fertilize the eggs and keep them for up to two weeks, depending on the species. The male seahorse is the only male in the entire animal world that it experiences childbirth. And many seahorse pairs remain monogamous through the entire breeding season, and some couples are committed to life. By remaining faithful to one partner, the pairs have more time to undergo more pregnancies and ultimately have greater reproductive success. But the home of the pygmy seahorse is degrading. We know over geologic time, coral reefs have died and come back in a continuum of vitality and catastrophe. But the degradation of coral reefs today from overfishing, climate change, ocean acidification, and pollution is alarming. And the only home of the pygmy seahorse is disappearing along with the wealth of biological diversity. And this is happening on our watch. Since I began my career as a marine biologist and as a professional diver back in 1991, we have lost over 50% of our coral reefs. And in some places, 90% of the hard-building coral are gone. Some scientists predict that coral reefs as we know them today may be gone in the next 50 years. 
So by protecting pygmy seahorses and their only home, coral reefs, we are protecting our future. Corals are one of nature's wonders. To really understand and appreciate the beauty and the fragility of coral reefs, we need to better understand the amazing capacity of a tiny animal, the little coral that makes the reefs of the world. Yes, coral is an animal. And together, each individual polyp works to create these reefs that we find all around the tropics. Almost magically, corals could pour cal pull calcium carbonate from the water column and secrete an exoskeleton. Within this skeleton, you have a thin layer of tissue that's programmed for survival. Corals are hunters, hunting primarily at night. Using their stinging tentacles, they reach up into the water column to collect what's ever drifting by. But corals have another magical trick up their sleeves. They are farmers. Microscopic algae lives within the tissue of the coral. It's a wonderful, very valuable partnership where they both benefit. Up to 90% of the food from the coral actually comes from its farm of zooxanthellies. Nothing is wasted in this partnership. The waste from the coral becomes fertilizer for the plant or the zooxanthellae, and the zooxanthellae makes food for the coral. There are a lot of wonderful lessons of sustainability within the coral reefs. These solar underwater cities that use the sun's energy, they are efficient recyclers, maintaining critical nutrients and keeping them within the coral reef ecosystem. And corals are home builders. They build three-dimensional structures that are the perfect habitat then for a million plus different species to inhabit and thrive. Back in 2009, during a very inspirational TED Talk, Dr. Sylvia Earle said, and she's a National Geographic explorer and has been all around the world, and she said, the next 10 years may be the most important for our species in the next 10,000 years to protect what remains of the natural systems that sustains all life. Dr. Sylvia Earle, along with many other ocean conservationists, say, first, we must know. What we do know is the ocean sustains all life on this planet. The oceans provide life-giving oxygen, regulates the climate, provides much-needed protein for the world, and is a beautiful place for a spiritual connection. As an economic engine, the ocean generates over $2.3 trillion in services and benefits to the world on an annual basis. Now that we better understand and appreciate the value of the ocean, we have made great strides in ocean conservation. When Dr. Sylvia Earle gave her TED Talk in 2009, we protected less than 1% of the ocean as marine protected areas, or areas with no fishing or extraction of natural resources. And today, we protect over 6%. But when we look at this map, many scientists will say, that's still not enough. So how can we increase this important stewardship in better protecting our global water planet? I was a part of an expedition with Jean-Michel Cousteau to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, one of the most remote island chains in the world. As we dove these islands, these secluded wilderness, we were so fortunate to see such an abundance of schooling fish, huge schools of coral reef fish, apex predators, sharks, and jacks on almost every dive. We thought the inaccessibility of these islands shielded them from the worst of humanity. But it did not take long for us to find footprints of human impact. We found marine debris and plastics everywhere on these remote islands. Plastic that was inside dead seabirds. I pulled out plastic toothbrushes, bottle caps, kids' toys, with languages from all around the world. And this was inside one single lace sand albatross. 
We know millions of tons of plastic and debris ends up in the ocean every year, and it practically stays there. Plastic is indestructible, only breaking down into smaller pieces, but practically never disappearing. This is a very solvable problem, and it all starts with each and every single one of us. We know companies and corporations and countries are, are really doing some wonderful movement in banning single-use plastic. Starbucks just announced that all 28,000 stores will no longer have plastic straws by 2020. So these are just some of the few things we could do: is thinking about our daily use and hopefully minimizing the use of single-use plastic. What about your sunscreen? The state of Hawaii just passed the world's first legislation to ban sunscreens with oxybenzone and other toxic chemicals. It's a bold step that the state is taking to eliminate one local stressor, as we know that these toxic chemicals, oxybenzone, are poisonous or toxic to corals, fish, marine mammals, and even us. Another impact is overfishing, but sustainable seafood is such an important solution we all have at our fingertips. The Monterey Bay Seafood Watch Guide is a great place to learn about what seafood to buy and what not to buy. So, with these simple choices and with this change, I hope to help inspire a more ocean literate society where we all embrace the importance of a sustainable ocean. Imagine if we all understood ocean literacy, the means of the influence of the ocean on you and your influence on the ocean. There is an ocean within us all. No matter where we live, we're intricately connected to the ocean. As my mentor Jean-Michel Cousteau always says, "If we protect the ocean, we protect ourselves." So let's protect our planet's most precious. Beautiful ecosystem coral reefs, and let's together ensure a healthy future for pygmy seahorses. Thank you.